Thanks, Francis, and thanks for having me here. Um, I couldn't get up without giving a plug. Um, as I'm the chair of the next IMA session. So all the people that picked up a koala, if you're lucky enough to get one before they all disappeared, um, that is in honour of the next IMA meeting, which, um, if some of you don't know, um, does always um, include clay science. So we would love to have you all there. Um, clay mineralogy is always a part of IMA. And although um, we know that you have your own specialist meetings, um, all of mineralogy would like to have clay mineralogy as part of it. So we don't want to um, exclude anyone. So today, let's see, I'm going to tell you a little about the Hydrotalkup Supergroup. Now I'm the seventh or eighth today, so a few little bits might have been covered by other people, but just in case no one has um, covered anything, I may go over a few things that have been covered. But what I'm going to do today is give a bit of an overview of what my group's been doing in the last eight or nine years. And I'm going to be focusing mostly on the application and not delving deep into all the graphs and things like that. So hopefully this will give you a bit of a grand scale overview of what hydrotelkites are good for, why we should care about them, and what they're going to do to um, contribute to humanity. So I got in interested in hydrotalkites in 2007 and one of the reasons why I got interested in them was because of systematic mineralogy. When I started working on them for my postdoc, I was trying to characterize um, a whole suite of mineral samples. And when I started to do that, I worked out that there was a lot of big problems. So when I started to delve a little bit deeper, I found that there was all these minerals in this group. A lot of them were poorly characterized and it needed somebody to go over and work through the whole lot. And that's really where my love affair of hydrochalkites began. So these structures are based on the archetype, oops, the archetype mineral, which is hydrotalkite, which is the magnesium aluminium carbonate in the group. And this is also the um, phase that's most commonly looked at in terms of chemistry. So what we have is um, metal 2 plus and metal 3 plus cations that are in a brucite layer. And this is just an example of the ones found in nature. So if these are um, any indication of the amount that you can find in nature, you can imagine how many possible minerals you can have, and that's only if you consider carbonate as the uh, interlayer cation. But we can also have exotic things such as sulfate, chloride, um, antimony, and sodium. So when you start to times all these together, there is unlimited potential in the amount of minerals that you can find in nature. But at the moment, what we have is we have 44 minerals which have been described as being natural examples of LDH faces. And these are called either the hydrotalkites or the hydrotalkite group. What's interesting about this group is that they exhibit polytypism. So what that means is that they have a number of examples of the same chemistry, but different structures built up on the layers. Now, this is fine, we all know this. In chemistry, this doesn't matter. But in mineralogy, this is a big problem because a mineral with the same formula um, and the same stacking is not a separate mineral species. So what's happened um, was even in the 1940s, it was recognized that um, hydrotalkites had polytypes, but modern mineralogy hasn't caught up with the group. So what we did was we had a subcommission and we worked on the nomenclature. So this is what they look like in nature. Now I'll preface this with the fact that most people that work on natural um, hydrotalkites have probably almost never seen a crystal, especially one like this. Um, out of about a thousand localities in the world, there's about <laughs> two or three that actually have crystals. Um, and most of the time you've got to work on powders. 
This one is a nine, uh, manganese dominant one, Shiga. This is the best specimen of this species in the world, which is about three centimetre sized crystals. But what most of us work on is things like this. Um, polycrystalline um, powdery type phases, which is not dissimilar to what you can make in the lab. So nature doesn't do it a lot better than what we can do in a hydrothermal synthesis. So what do these structures look like? These are just some of the ones that we've done recently, um, at least in uh, so far as we could find in the literature. We now have the record for the longest periodicity in an LDH mineral, and this is for zinc l -stubite. So we've got zinc and aluminium in the brucite layer, and we've got antimony octahedra in here. And the periodicity of this is about 89 angstroms. These are little crystals that we found in um, Italy. The most common polytype is this one here. Um, this is for a moss barite, 3R. So 3R, we have the metal octahedral layers, and in here we have the carbonates and the water. Um, what's common in the antimony ones is T structures. So here is a 2T where we've got nickel and iron at a two to one ratio. And then we have antimony in the interlayer. So after about five years of hard work, finding hundreds of um, references and trying to go back forensically through all these minerals, we worked out that there is a bunch of polytypes which need to be discredited. So what that means is they're no longer minerals anymore. So what we did was we discredited these minerals and now we just use standard AUCR polytype nomenclature for members of the hydrotalkite group. So instead of saying monasiite for a 2H hydrotalkite, you just got hydrotalkite. So what this has done is trying to um, consolidate the literature as well because we often have people saying things are hydrotalkite-like, things are monasiite-like, but actually it's really just the same phase. So what we're hoping in part of this is to bring the literature back down this way so that we stop confusing what we're talking about when we're talking about the chemistry of these phases. And there's another important thing that's coming next, or oh, after this one. Um, we also couldn't tell um, for several of them, whether they were distinct minerals or not, and we just flag them for people to go and work at, and a couple of these have been knocked off since. So if we look at the first one found, that's hydrotalkite, it was first described in 1842, so it was a real old guy. Um, back in historic mineralogy, there wasn't a requirement to work on a sample, keep that sample, and then put it in a museum so that 50 years later someone could come and look at it. So there was no type specimen. Everyone's always thought that hydrotalkites were typically the 3R polytype, but if you go and have a look at the literature going back all the way from the 1800s through the early 1900s when people like Frondel were first looking at hydrotalkites and then extend it into modern mineralogy, we have examples of things being called hydrotalkite that have a 2 to 1 ratio and a 3 to 1 ratio. So in mineralogy, when you have um, different ratios like this, they can't be the same mineral. So we went, uh-oh, does hydrotalkite really exist? Because if it has a 2 to 1 ratio, it's a different mineral than if it has a 3 to 1 ratio. And in 1993, the mineral called catenite was described from single crystals in Quebec with a ratio of two to one. From the inorganic chemistry literature, we know that the 3R polytype can persist in any ratio, but in mineralogy, we can't really do much with this. So what we did is a forensic audit of German um, minerals um, collections, and we found that these two specimens have survived for 150 years in Berlin. So these were collected by Hochstetter, who described it, and they were given to his PhD supervisor, who basically helped him work out what the formula of 
hydrotail crab was back then. So 150 years ago is a little bit more difficult to work out the formula of minerals. And then he gave these specimens to the Natural History Museum of Berlin and then we found them. So these are the closest things to the type specimens. They would have used up probably all the specimen that they actually got the chemistry of back then. So what we've done is these are the only things we can find with a direct link back to them. So we've given them neotype status, which means the closest thing to a type that you can get. So in looking at these specimens, we did X-ray diffraction, and these are actually the 3R polytype. So that's okay. We then looked at the chemistry of them, and these were okay too, three to one. So the type locality with the old specimens is fine. So hydrotalkite does exist. But the examples in the literature where there are two to one is catenite and not hydrotalkite, which is a completely different mineral with a different space group, has different properties, and it shouldn't be um, confused. What's, what's confusing for the mineralogist uh, literature is that you can have a 3R polytype. So what people have got to be very careful of is what mineral they're calling what and what polytype, because we're not really caring about the polytype. When you talk using a mineral name, that actually gives you the formula. So that's what imp what's important. So it's always important to know when you're using a mineral name that it's not the polytype that's the species defining characteristic, it's the name and the chemistry. So you use the wrong name, you got the wrong chemistry. So in 2007, I started working on carbon sequestration, which is where a lot of this nomenclature stuff was derived from. Now, mining tailings are very interesting things, and there's been some good talks in the last um, few days on people looking at zeolites and things for carbon uptake. Now, hydrotalkites have this uncanny ability to do the same thing. So carbon dioxide is trapped in mineral structures over geological time. So when we're talking about trying to get rid of um, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, putting it in a mineral is going to outlast probably um, human time scale. What we have is already a source. So most hard rock mines produce tailings, and these tailings just sit there doing nothing, but they can actually be reservoirs that can be used to get rid of carbon from the atmosphere. So if we have a look at the potential, mineral carbonation sits right up here, especially in time scale. They're stable over geological time periods, which means it's fine for human time periods. If we look at things like underground injection, the time scale that they're projected to actually stay underground because of geological activities have the potential to disturb them, it's actually not as much as mineral carbonation. So if we've got a choice of one or the other, I'd argue that mineral carbonation should be the one that we're going for. And slowly over time, the injection sites around the world are becoming fewer and far between because there's so few sites to inject carbon underground, it's logistically difficult and actually it may not keep carbon underground for as long as some other things. So if we look at where we're heading, if we have the business as usual kind of thing, so all the governments couldn't care less about whether we put carbon into the atmosphere, we burn all the coal, we do everything we can to wreck the environment. We're going to plateau out here in about 200 years at about 2200 parts per million carbon. So we're probably not going to be around if that happens. And then slowly after time, it'll tail off. But what's important about this is that if we don't exist at this point, what's going to happen are uh, the minerals and the rocks are going to solve the problem that we made ourselves. So give the rocks a million years and they should have got rid of all the carbon that we put into the atmosphere. So that's an important point for the planet. It doesn't help us very much though. So if we look at scales now, so this is, a, which was at one time the biggest underground injection site in Norway, 
and here next to it is the Mine Pond Tailings Dam at Mount Keith, which is a reasonably large, but not super, super large, um, tailings pond in a nickel mine. So if we have a look at the size, this is just one pond in one mine in one area versus the biggest injecting site. If you think of Western Australia that has maybe 10,000 mines, then you might you multiply that by the amount of mines that are around the world. This is why you see that mineral carbonation really holds a good future for us. So if we have a look at just the process, so we've got atmospheric carbon coming down, we've got weathering of the rocks, releasing things like magnesium into the groundwater and they combine together to create minerals. During the mining process, we have several dynamic things. We've got the actual plant itself, which reduces carbon into the atmosphere. We have the crushing and sorting ponds, which are a dynamic process. That reacts with the atmosphere, having a carbon uptake. We have the tailings pond down here, which also interacts with the atmosphere. And it also interacts with living things like trees. So the several points where carbon interacts um, with these things and we can actually look at trying to enhance this process and get it all going. So these were some of our um, test pit sites. So Mount Keith Nickel Mine, which is Western Australia, and I was working in Canada at the time, and we were primarily focused on these places up in Canada. Now, these Canadian places were very good proof of concept because they had abundant magnesium. So magnesium carbonates, there's quite a good series, which are all very stable, which means that whenever you have a magnesium source, and if you don't, if you have a magnesium source near you, it's beneficial to bring the magnesium on site to get these minerals forming. And if we look at the kind of scale, at Mount Keith, they were adding about 11 million tonnes a year of waste. At the Clinton Creek Chrysotile Mine, about the same. Um, Cassia, we got 17, and the Divic Diamond Mine um, has only two. But millions and millions of tonnes in all these mines contributing um, waste to the environment. But even if you don't do anything, magnesium carbonates like to form by themselves. So this is a geological process that happens whether we like it or not. And this is the kind of things that you'll see when you go there. So these efflorescent crusts, you can get coatage and drains. So we've got a dynamic process happening where we've got water running through and interacting with the top of the mine tailings um, coming out of little seepage drains through here. And it also likes to form cement. So when I showed you the hydrocalumite about 10 slides ago, that was a cement. Hydrotalcites really like to form cements binding things together. So this all happens without us actually doing anything. So we know it's a geological process um, that we can actually look at enhancing. So if we actually have a look at what the tailings look like, this is an example of the Mount Keith tailings. So in these tailings, we have about 6.73% carbonate by mass in stitch type. So if we just look at this one mineral, we times it by the amount that we have in the tailings pond. Stitch type in there exceeds 45,000 metric tons a year. So this is just one of the carbonate minerals and this one carbon mineral, if we had carbon credits still in Australia, would equate to half a million dollars a year. So that's at $10 per carbon credit. When it was back at 60, that's a hell of a lot of money. So you can start to see big dollars in here. And this is a process before we've even started to optimize it. So cystrite's just one of the minerals in here. Another, there's got some other hydrotalcites in here without <coughs> carbon but with chlorine. So if we say, all right, if we can get half a million dollars a year out of stitch tight, if we get rid of the chlorine in the other hydrotalkites, get the carbon in, 
then all of a sudden we've just got another million dollars in carbon credits. And what you find is if you make this a dynamic process, all of a sudden, instead of having to pay money for your mine, you actually start to make money out of it. And this is where the mining companies start to become interested. And if we look at the carbon fingerprinting, so we take these um, carbonate minerals, we say, where does all the carbon come from? We see that it will really interact with all the different carbon sources. So we'll have bedrock carbon, so carbon that's come from the rocks, carbon that's come from the trees, a little bit from other industries. So depending on how remote your mine is, will be how much it interacts in this sphere. And as other people have shown, a lot of atmosphere, you have any kind of hydrochalcite sitting on a bench, it's going to interact with the atmosphere. So it really is dynamic and it really is sucking up atmospheric carbon. So it's a real thing. So if we have a look at just one mine, so this is Clinton Creek. So it contains about 160,000 tonnes of carbonate just sitting there like that. So that's a really big resource. That's a lot of carbon that's just sucked up, sitting there, it's geologically stable. It may not look pretty, but it's better being there than in the environment. So not too bad. So large mining operations can fix between 50 and 100 um, kilotons of carbon per year. So big, big, big numbers. So there's other processes that can also be involved in this. So bacteria really like to um, come in and be involved in hydrotalkites. And at the Clinton Creek mine in Yukon, we found that there were several cyanobacteria that were helping the process get along. And you'll see that, you know, this doesn't really look too nice, but the process is also bio as much as it is um, geo. So if we just think about it in a nice broad sense, um, whenever you have magnesium silicates as residue, you can use that to help form hydrotalkites and um, get carbon going from the atmosphere. It's important that there's multiple pathways for sequestration. If there was just one, it wouldn't be as effective, but we actually have four, and those four help really get rid of the carbon from the atmosphere. Um, of course, it depends on a number of factors, like the weather, um, whether you're, you've got freezing and cooling, but we can see that having a look at the isotopes, it's an effective tool for understanding where the carbon came from. And we can actually do carbon dating to see if this has been happening for a long time. And we can see that there's thousands of years of this happening in nature without us doing anything. So we know that it's going to be OK to use that as a process without it all leaching out and going back to the atmosphere. So I'll kind of digress from the carbon to what we've been working on for about the last five or six years. And that is looking at green rust laid double hydroxide minerals. So it started some 30 years or so ago with Jean-Marie looking at the corrosion of steel and this green film that forms on it. But what's interesting is the natural occurrences. So it's split up into the three minerals Fougerite, Triburdenite, and Mosbarite, and they each have some different geological environments that they form in. What's interesting about green rusts is that they are iron only. So instead of having magnesium and aluminium, we've got iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus, and all the natural ones have carbonate in the interlayer. So if we have a look at what they're good for, so if we start with the iron in steel, what happens in the first process is we've got reduction of iron um, metal into iron 2 plus to create ferrous hydroxide. Um, these will interact depending on where it is. If it's near the sea, you might get chlorine with the atmosphere, carbon and sulfate. And then you can form green rust. So we want to go this way down into the ferric green rust, not that way 
into the common rust, which are all of these ones. The ferric green rusts are important because they protect the steel, they give a nice coating. The common rusts are bad, they just keep on corroding. So we want to go this way, not that way. So again, what I'm interested in is seeing how this is all brought together in nature, and then we can go and see what happens after that. So what's nice is it's not very hard to go and find tons and tons and tons of this in nature. So we started off by looking for natural occurrences of triburdenite and mosparite, and it just so happens that the coastline pretty much from here, all along here, all along here, is covered in it. So we've got about 300 kilometres of coastline of these minerals to work with. And they were first extracted near the town of Penvern um, in northern Brittany. And we can see that it has this distinctive green colour of the soil. And once you get your eye in and you start seeing other places, when you see this colour, you're like, aha, I know what's going on. So here, you got this green colour. But one of the main places that we've been interested in is Mont Saint-Michel, which happens to be a World Heritage Site, the second most visited place in all of Europe. And it is the type of locality for Mosbara. So a place that has about 14 or 15 million people walking all over here, all of this green stuff is Mosbara. And this is what it looks like. So anyone that's been to Mont Saint-Michel, most people take off their shoes and socks and then they go walk around the outside of the abbey. It's all green and gloopy. You've been walking on a new mineral. And this is what it looks like. So there's a very thin layering of sand. It's buffered by some organic matter, not in all places, but in some. And then we have this glay. Um, when it's up on the beach, it's quite hard. When it's in the tide line, it's all soft and gloopy. We can do the same thing as what we did with the carbonates. We can date it to see how long this process has been going. And we find out that it's thousands of years at work. These LDHs have been working for the environment. And this is what it looks like. So what's the application of green rust? We get to a worldwide problem, and that is algal blooms. Algal blooms cost economies all over the world millions and millions of dollars. Not only are they unsightly, it causes problems for pollution, it kills animals, you can't do a lot of things. And it happens because of intensive farming. So as land gets poorer, people pour lots and lots of fertilizers into the land. What this does is it releases excess nitrogen into the waters and the waters are then um, nitrogen rich and phosphorus rich sometimes, and then the algae eat all that up and bloom. So what's the economic impact? Just in a few select countries, 100 million years in USA, 255 million in Spain. This number seems weird because, you know, America, big country, economic output. But what happens in Spain is the blue-green algae actually happens in areas where they cultivate oysters. So when you have a blue-green algae outbreak, you can't eat the oysters. So it can kill whole complete crops for a year. If you have an outbreak like this, no oysters. In Norway, 50 million for much the same reasons. It affects the seafood crops. And where I'm from in Australia, it's a 200 million a year problem. Anytime there's a um, algae outbreak, they have to close off the areas, they have to bring in the health department, they have to monitor it, all these other things. So big, big money, big, big problem. So we go to this problem and we see how can we fix it? And Green Rust has the answer to fix it. So we start off up here. We have some iron. It interacts with the atmosphere, with carbon also interacts with the nitrogen that's in the water, reducing the NO3 to NO2. So when we have the green rust forming by bacteria, it then interacts 
with the nitrogen and just like people have been doing in different experiments, just not with nitrogen, this is reduced into gas, a bit like the last person that showed that the um, carbon was released as carbon dioxide. Same process happens and we get the release of nitrogen gas. So what's happening is as this process occurs, we get the two plus going to three plus. So the more that this will occur, you'll go from fougerite to triburdenite and then finally to mosbarite. But the nice thing about this is that you can have bacteria which further interact as the two plus and three plus are being converted and they can convert the green rust back to iron two plus um, green rust and the whole process is dynamic and should keep on going. So the environment has solved a problem for us that we didn't even know we had. But the problem with the environment is that it can be overloaded. It'll happen as a process, but if we're putting all this extra stuff into the water, it just won't be able to cope. So because we know how to make these minerals, we, can, we know what the problem is. We want to go on this pathway to reducing nitrogen into gas, what we don't want is the other thing that can happen without green rust, and that's the production of ammonium, which is itself a pollutant. So it's like having a double pollutant instead of a problem. So we want to have green rust in the water, whether it's natural or we can put it there. And what I can show you is green rust where we put it there. So this is a test site in France, in Lenon. And we have um, a reed bed here, we have um, a barrier, and we have um, um, green rust down here. And what we have is recycling of water which has nitrate in it, and we're actually getting this process to happen by running it through. And what we've seen is that for an, an area, we can get about one metre square per person's worth of water and we can treat that water and get the nitrogen out um, without having too much area. So as the nitrogen is released, it comes out of these pipes and voila, problem solved. But obviously, if you want to do this in New York City, you're not going to do something like this for 17 million people. So not bad as a first step. It's more of a proof of concept, but you can build something on a small scale that solves this problem. So where else can we apply this kind of idea and technology to? One of those is into activated sludge. So in a sewage treatment plant, um, you have solids which go in, it interacts with activated sludge to try and get all the nasty things to bind onto its surface settles and goes out, and what you end up with is a quite nasty um, thing um, with all heavy metals and stuff dissolved on the surface. So as this kind of activated sludge could be replaced in the future by a green rust, which will also do this process, but maybe a little less toxic in the end than what we've got now. Um, what my group here is about to start on is looking at um, taking radionuclides from water. So in the wake of the Fukushima disaster, um, we have a plant which is producing um, very hot water in order to keep it cool. And what they're doing at the moment is keeping it in storage tanks. These storage tanks are almost full and there is rumour that um, by the end of the year, they're going to have to start dumping radioactive water into the sea like they did about three years ago. So this may be a problem, but LDHs have probably got a solution for this as well. So what we're going to try and do is basically babushka the cesium. So here's the cesium ion. We, have, um, we can put these in CTC cages. These guys really like to lock up cesium naturally. And what we want to do is intercalate them into the interlayer space in LDH. So this is locked up in this, which is locked up in this, and it's basically not going anywhere. Now, seawater would normally be a problem for a lot of things because they would like to suck up the chlorine. However, um, these CTC cages um, 
specifically like cesium over chlorine, so we can get rid of that if we were trying to do a seawater type cleanup. So what well, my take home message with things like this is, is if you can think of something, probably there's an application for it in LDHs. And there's so many people that work around the world on LDHs trying to come up with various treatments and cleaning things that really it's up to us to have a, a good imagination and we can come up with something that can solve a problem. Um, in my immediate future, um, as John marie just let people know, was to find the first occurrence of a green rust in Australia. I figured that 300 kilometres of France can't be the only place that you could find it. So I hopped in my four-wheel drive and drove around the Murray Basin, did 3,500 kilometres, but found the first occurrence of green rust at Yanga Lake in New South Wales in the Murray River Basin. And as soon as I got out of the car, I saw a green colour. I walked up to the side of the lake. It was bright green and I just went, aha, I got it. And that's what it looks like. So it looks exactly the same as if we were going out in France, except um, the interesting thing about this is it's actually the first occurrence where we've had the whole series go through and we've ended up with the iron 3 plus moss barite instead of one of these intermediate ones going from iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus. So the next step for us is to work out um, which bacteria are in this lake and to see if any of these bacteria are going to help move the green rust processes even further because, you know, maybe there's something in this lake that will tell us um, something to help build a big plant to clean, denitrificate water. So finding mic microbes which help reduce nitrate is going to be where it goes next. And one of the good things about doing field work in Australia is there's lots of nice parrots and this is a juvenile Mallee ringneck at the site. So he was watching over me and we found some good green rust. So thank you for your attention and thanks for coming. <laughs>